To my left is Nadia Whittam, Labour MP for Nottingham East. Next to her, Damien Green, Conservative MP for Ashford, who chairs the One Nation Conservative Caucus. Um, to my right is Annabel Denham, Deputy Comment Editor of the Daily Telegraph, and making his debut on the programme, Nels Abbey, writer and broadcaster, who's the author of the satirical book Think Like a White Man. They're here to answer your questions. 0345 6060973 is the number to call. You can text 84850. You can WhatsApp 0345 6060973. And you can say, Alexa, send a comment to LBC. There's no excuse for not getting in touch, really, is there? And, of course, you can watch us on Global Player. Call 0345 6060973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Well, let's go to our first caller. It's Robbie in Chelmsford. Hello, Robbie. Evening, Ian. Evening, panel. My question is, recent opinion polls are quite clear on two things. One, the Tory government is historically unpopular. And two, the British people prioritise public service investment over tax cuts. So can anyone explain why this government is likely to propose more tax cuts tomorrow? Damien Green. I thought that might fall to me. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the question. Um, I think, I mean, the first thing to say is that if you ask people, uh, do you want tax cuts, uh, they will feel, oh, I better not say that. It seems somehow impolite and slightly un-British to say, uh, I'd, I'd like, quite like to keep more of my own money. But actually, people do, and people should. I mean, yeah, that, uh, it's, ne- it's never obvious that the government spends your money better than you do. There is, there is clearly... Um, an issue about you, you have to fund public services adequately, um, but also you, those public services have to run efficiently. And one of the uh, reasons why the economy has struggled over you know, since COVID really uh, is that productivity is low and productivity is particularly low and falling in large parts of the public sector. So I think you could get a lot more and better public services uh, if, if they were run more efficiently, and that would give the Chancellor room to allow all of us to keep more of the money uh, that we work for. But that implies cutting money from public services. Not necessarily, because the economy grows and... Does it? Well, but most of the time, you know, and it, you know, it has uh, grown. It's been pretty anemic. I'm not going to deny that fact. Um, but uh, I'm sure this year we, we will see it growing uh, faster than it has. And I think one of the things that will contribute to that is to allow people uh, to keep more of their own money uh, so that, that, you know, they can spend it in the way they like and that in itself contributes to economic growth. Nadia? I mean, where do we even start on that? Um, I think Robbie sums it up perfectly in his question, actually. And if we start with a bit of context, so we've had 14 years of Conservative governments. In that time, they said that they would level up areas like Nottingham. In fact, everything has got worse. The NHS is on its knees. We've got the worst recorded cost of living crisis. Um, The economy is in recession. Homelessness is soaring. Just yesterday, we had that harrowing story that 55 children have died in the last four years and homelessness has been recorded as one of the causes of their deaths. Now, against the backdrop of that, the government is set to propose tax cuts funded by spending cuts. And I think when you've got 7 million people on NHS waiting lists and £2 billion is set to be cut from, from health spending, That is unforgivable. It's not just me who thinks that. Two former Treasury advisers have said that this is the last thing that the British economy needs. Um, 16% of the British public would does not back tax cuts if that means spending cuts exactly as Robbie said. When Damien talks about productivity, the way we increase productivity is by investing in our public services, not by further cutting them. You know, we've been told every year since 2010, let's trim the fat from public services. What is there left to cut? There isn't anything. And on on growth and the economy growing, We were told at the last budget that this would be a budget for growth, that, you know, short-term pain for long-term gain, um, this future that we were promised, it's never arrived. So I just don't think we can believe a word. You you mentioned two billion being cut from the NHS budget. That's that's a new one on me. Where where did you hear that from? 
from um, that would be set to be cut from the health budget. But what, what, where's the source of that? I don't have the source to hand, but we could sit down and Google it together afterwards <laughs> if you like. Uh, health, health spending's gone up hugely in recent years, uh, to the point where it is taking a very large proportion of, of the public sector. And, and, of course, the NHS has problems, but actually money going into it isn't one of the problems. Which actually is what your colleague Wes Streeting has said. I mean, he, he's not promising huge amounts of money for the NHS, is he? If trimming the fat on public services was something that worked, then, you know, our NHS wouldn't be in a better position, councils wouldn't be in a better position, but we're seeing the opposite. That two billion figure, that's IFS analysis, and it's a projection for the coming year. Right. Amanda. Annabelle. I was, I was Amanda. wondering I at the outset why. how many times you'd call me Amanda. I know, I don't know why I've got it in my head. Ingrained in your I mind. Do, I do apologise. Well, to the point on public services, um, I mean, when it comes to the NHS, as Damien has pointed out, we've seen a 2% increase in NHS funding um, across, as an average across the years of Conservative government. And now we're spending around £180 billion a year on the healthcare system. And yet, it seems to be in a constant state state of crisis. We cannot continue to argue that more funding is the solution. I think when people talk about wanting more money for public services rather than that money being spent on tax cuts, when they think about public services, they think about the basic functions of government, the core functions of government. And that does include, at the moment, the NHS, but also things like education and welfare. But unfortunately, the government now is so bloated that it has expanded its tentacles into many other areas of our economy and our society. And it needs to have a fundamental rethink, not just about efficiency and waste in those departments, which many people would view as essential and need to be run by government, but also it needs to ask things like, why is the government involved in childcare in this country? Do we need a department for culture, media and sport? What about the Crangocracy? I know that David Cameron took a side to it, but is there more that work that could be done on that side? So there's a massive amount that could, I think could be done on the government spending side of the ledger that doesn't need to have an impact on the public services that people rely on. Nelson. Well, I just want to say one quick thing to um, to Annabelle. That to, when we look at, do we need a department for culture, media, and sport? That's perhaps one of the few areas where we're doing quite well as a nation right now. And I think that hey, that further investment in that, also uh, how we portray global Britain, or how we portray our nation on the global stage, is absolutely essential. Going back to the question from Robbie. Um, why a tax cut right now? I think it's just pretty much desperation driven recklessness by a historically unpopular government that is effectively really and truly right now at this particular stage they should be I mean, it's unjustifiable. You cannot actually tax cut, uh, cut taxes in this moment where we actually really need investment into areas such as the NHS. And I really think people really need to understand that when rubber hits the road, when you walk into the NHS, when you go into the a and &E, for example, which I went into about a month ago, I was so almost appalled by it that I actually walked out. I felt it would be safer for me to go home and just actually try and grin and bear whatever I was going through than actually stay in the hospital and risk potentially catching something else. It was that dire. So how we as a nation, how we actually technically fund things right now, um, in light of, um, in, in light of a, a, another tax cut, I mean, it makes me a little bit worried. But additionally too, I, I actually think... Even when we have the highest tax burden since the 1940s. We may do, and I agree with that. I, obviously, that's that's true. We do have the highest tax burden. We've got high tax ration, we've got high inflation, and we've got... Um, and also too, we have high interest rates. And to me, that's where the taxation element, the tax cut or so, of potentially £450 a year for a person on average income of 34000 a year, it's a bit of a red herring to me. Um, because really, truly, if you live in, say, London, average rents are going up by about £450 a month. So that wipes that out already. Also, that, that means pretty much you've got... You'd be worse off without it. Well, yeah, you would be worse <laughs> off without it. But, it, I mean, without, again, the recklessness of the government that we were, of the, of the Conservative Party, that, uh, the governing Conservative Party or so, we wouldn't be in this situation right now. And that's where it becomes a lot more, a lot more concerning to people. Because, again, so, and I must point out, too, once again, too, so 
Of course, cutting taxes is always nice um, if for us, for everybody to get a little bit more money. But if your rent has gone up by 450, 500, or say my mortgage, which has gone up by 600 pound a month, giving me a little 450 pound or whatever it might be to me, uh, or removing the tax burden from me, it's nice on paper. But in reality, the matter is that it, it doesn't really do much to alleviate the problem that we're facing. Additionally, too, I must point out, for, particularly for renters, even if interest rates collapse tomorrow back down to 0%, which they won't, but let's say they did collapse back down to 0%, tomorrow. The other issue we have is that interest, um, inflation is cumulative. So your landlord isn't going to actually reduce the price you pay on month or uh, price you pay on rent every single month. You are stuck where they are, even if the landlord's making some savings on interest rates. So the tax cut element or so, lovely as it might do, as it is, or it might sound or so, we can't particularly afford it right now. It feels desperate. It feels reckless. And um, in light of um, extremely high interest rates are completely unaffordable and have already pushed this into a recession, I think it's a bit of a red herring. Damien Green, if there wasn't an election due this year, do you seriously think that Jeremy Hunt will be looking at any tax cuts tomorrow? Yes, I do. Uh, and I think, I mean, you've made the point that we have got a historically high tax burden. And so uh, every Conservative or whatever type of Conservative will, will want to bring that down. We are uncomfortable uh, with high tax rates. And I think, I mean, the point Nelson making is, is a good one about the housing market, but it's not actually an argument against tax cuts. It's an argument for sorting out uh, the housing market. And um, I, I hope that, with the, as you say, I, I chair the, uh, the One Nation Caucus of, of moderate Conservative MPs, and we have put forward our suggestions for the budget. And we've said that one of the things we, we would like to see uh, the Chancellor do is, is make some difference to the housing market, both for renters uh, and for potential homeowners, um, by, for instance, uh, allowing people to use uh, some of their pension pots as a deposit. A lot of people are stuck renting, uh, be even though they want to become homeowners, not because they couldn't afford the mortgage, because quite often a mortgage mm -hmm. is cheaper than a rent, um, but they can't afford the deposit. So actually freeing those people up uh, to allow them to have a deposit would both um, give them a better life, which is obviously the point, but and also uh, free up uh, some of the rental market. How, how much influence does the One Nation Caucus have over the Chancellor? Because we keep hearing about all of these new groups popping up on the right. They all seem to have the same people as members of them, but all, all with different names. But... I mean, people don't seem to realise that your group is actually the largest one of them all, isn't it? Yeah, we, we tend to be slightly less noisy um, because... Um, Maybe you should become a bit noisy. Well, we have become fairly noisy <laughs> recently, but um, we, we, we try and um, work in, in private and, and, you know, Jeremy Hunt is a One Nation Conservative, so um, he, he will come at things. I mean, we, he may not agree uh, with us on, on every individual matter, but he comes... Uh, from very much the same tradition of a, a pragmatic and practical approach, a non-ideological approach. And as I say, whatever type of conservative you are, you don't need to be an ideologue to think that we're very highly taxed and finding ways to reduce that tax burden is a good thing. The idea that Damien just put forward about using a pension pot to uh, fund a house deposit, I mean, is that something you could buy into, Nadia? Well, I think we've certainly got to look at... Uh, if we're talking about housing, the, the government proposed and pledged to build 300,000 new homes. That hasn't happened. That's something that needs to be done. But I just want to come back to this idea that these proposed tax cuts are something that would help working people or help the majority of people, because actually that's not the case. This national insurance cut, that would be a giveaway to the mostly the, the, the wealthiest no, yeah. at the at the expense of, of those most struggling. It would, because the 1p cut would um, mean that the 20 the richest 20 percent of households would get 12 times more than the poorest 20 percent of households. And for those on low wages, they'd be unlikely to get very much at all. Well, that that, that can't be, be true. If, if you just let me finish, because it would be offset by um, cuts to universal credits. That there was a, a table in the Daily Mail this morning, so it must be true if it's a Daily <laughs> Mail, obviously. Well, but, you said I mean, it. I, I mean, I'm sure that, that it is actually. And they had a table. I'm trying to remember the, the bands, but I think if you if you're on um, a below average income, you benefit to the tune of if it's a two p cut, but to about two hundred and fifty pounds. If you're on an average income, going up to about. 70 or 80 thousand pounds you get 450 and above that it's 754 for anybody above that so you're right in the sense 
that yes, if you if you are more well off, you get a couple of hundred pounds more. But it's not sort of benefit. An income tax cut would be far more beneficial to more well off people, wouldn't it? Uh, yes, um, but what I said is is still the case. That's um, and it is the case that the lowest paid wouldn't benefit from that because of cuts to universal credit. I think when we're looking at the tax system, we need to be building a just tax system that closes loopholes, that means that the wealthiest in society are, are paying their fair share and that those with the broadest shoulders are taking on um, the biggest responsibility. Right, let's move on to a different subject in just a moment. It's 17 minutes past eight. This is LBC. Damien Green is here. Nelson Abbey, Nadia Whittam and Annabelle Denham. Let's go to another caller. It's David in Enfield. David, what's your question, please? Yes, good evening, panel. Should Suella Braverman, Lee Anderson and Robert Jenrick be included in the group of extremists that Rishi Sunak warned us against last Friday? Well... There's a question. I mean, it is interesting that this whole general topic, it, I think it's featured on every cross-question for the last couple of weeks. It seems to have sort of struck some sort of chord with, with, with our listeners. I don't know how representative they are of the wider electorate. Now, so let's start with you. Ian, you're not going to believe I didn't hear a word of the question because I messed up my headphones. Oh, you did, didn't so, yes, you? Right, yeah. well, I'd better repeat it then. Uh, <laughs> should <laughs> Sue Ella Braverman, Robert Jenrick, Lee Anderson and others on the Tory right be included in the group of extremists that Rishi Sunak warned us about last week? Of course, absolutely, inherently, particularly Suella Braverman. I can't believe Suella Braverman is still a member of the Conservative Party. Um, Suella Braverman essentially incited the far right into the streets to take on protesters that she was a sitting 
Home Secretary. It, it sounds like a satire. How did she do that? Well, she was giving them... I can't remember, because it was, it was actually reporting the Independence, I believe, in The Guardian at the time, too. And I saw it in my own two eyes. The words she was saying, um, describing the actual demonstrations as hate mod, but it went further than that, too. So I can't remember her exact words, but it was really and truly explicitly clear that she was winking and nodding towards the far right, pretty much saying that, look, if we don't do something so-and-so, so people, things are going to happen. If it happens, that's where it... And it was almost as if, like, oh my goodness, our Home Secretary is inciting... And it happened, and the far right listened to her. So essentially, Suella Bravham, who's been operating almost as the MP for, for Douglas Murray Central, um, has effectively... It, to say that she's an extremist would be putting it mildly. And I wouldn't even put Braverman in the same bucket as um as um as generic and i would even say that so braverman's fantastically worse than um the anderson ever was so in terms of actual extremism across the board so whether braverman's always been somebody who's always pushed the line to an uncomfortable and dare i say un un unsanitized manner in politics that's quite crass, quite brute, but also a across the board, very, very beneath British politics in a manner that I'm really still surprised that Richard Sunak, who is a decent guy, who is a decent guy, who should be speaking his mind and should be exercising authority a lot more clearly, I just feel that Richard Sunak is letting himself down here. And if we find ourselves with a uh, with Suella Bradham, he did get rid of her. I, I know he appointed her as Home Secretary, and he appointed her from a position of weakness once again, a lack of confidence. But should Suella Bradham, should the ball come undone, and Suella Bradham, Bradham well, the ball's going to come undone in the next general election, we can see Suella Bradham somehow becomes. Um, leader of the Conservative Party, effectively the Conservative Party has swung fantastically and dangerously to the right. Irresponsible right. No, no respectability to it. Almost to the point where I would say that it was almost, with some of her rhetoric, it's almost Griffin, uh, Griffin-esque. So, um, yeah, I am very, very concerned. Annabelle. Well, the definition that we have of extremism um, it, it suggests that it is vocal or active opposition to fundamental British values, including democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, and mutual respect and tolerance of different faiths and beliefs. I don't see that Suella Braverman is an extremist by that definition at all. There are some conservative politicians who have made remarks that either I think are wrong or have been delivered in a very clunky way, but I don't think that that those remarks have led to the far right taking to the streets and behaving in a violent manner. What I think Sweller and others are doing is speaking for the silent majority in Britain today who are appalled at some of the behaviour that they are seeing on the streets at the moment, who are appalled that there are protesters who are chanting jihad and um, making comments that are pulled straight from the Hamas charter while the police stand by and do nothing. They're very uncomfortable with the fact that democracy appears to be under threat, with politicians unable to feel as though they can speak freely and properly represent their constituents, perhaps uncomfortable with the fact that a parliamentary debate was shut down and that an anti-Semitic chant uh, was projected onto Big Ben. And at the moment, I don't feel as though our political class are tackling this properly and while the Prime Minister's speech was stirring and welcome in many regards I think the part of the problem is the failure to acknowledge that the threat to our lives at the moment in Britain does not come in two equal halves, that Islamism makes up 75% of the terror caseload and until we are willing to properly acknowledge that and properly talk about it and follow that up with robust action then we can expect Tory politicians to perhaps strike out alone, as Lee Anderson and others have done, to try and assuage the British public who feel very unnerved by it. Sorry, every Muslim we disagree with is not an Islam. It's not a potential 9-11 hijacker or anything else. I must no, point out... Annabelle didn't but say that. No, I do, no, but say, no I, I'm not saying that. But what we say, the word Islamism is being thrown around <laughs> willy-nilly in a manner to, to describe a fantastic number of people who take a position, which actually is a popular position of the nation, in relation to the israel Gaza situation. where the calling for a ceasefire. We're talking about fundamentalists who want to potentially at some point commit terror attacks. We're talking about people who will go out onto the streets of Britain and 
chant jihad. Just back to <laughs> which was a which from the actual demonstration I saw was a micro, about possibly about twenty people or so who were shouting that situation. But so do you think that that makes about, it acceptable? Of course that even, it doesn't. That their vanishing it doesn't. Majority, minority makes it acceptable. Of course, and it that the police don't police these protests properly, I and they seem to think that just managing them and having a presence there is adequate. Um, so if we go back to November last year, the cenotaph, when the when Suella Braverman winked and nodded to get the far right to get the far right into the streets, and never said anything to actually condemn it afterwards. Um, if you actually take a look at it, nine police officers were injured that day. That was the. There hasn't been any re reports of police officers getting injured other than when the sitting Home Secretary, sitting Conservative Home Secretary, winked and nodded and almost was was whistled was a dog whistling okay. for the, for you, the whole. You made that point. Now let's bring in our other two panelists, Nadia. What David's referring to here, I think, is Michael Gove's um, proposed widening of the definition of extremism. I, I think, obviously, a balance needs to be struck between um, combating violent extremist ideology, which is obviously important, and protecting free speech and political activism. Obviously, this guidance hasn't been published yet, so... Um, we're, we're speculating and when it is published I'll, I'll read it carefully and take a view but what I really worry about is the backdrop against which this is being proposed and when, when I say that I mean the government curbing civil liberties and stirring division, stirring up um, a culture war that blames Muslims trans people, migrants, you name it, for, for the problems that people are experiencing. Yeah. <coughs> but do you regard does... those three politicians that David mentioned in his questions as extremists? That does make me question the motivations of, of the government in bringing forward this legislation. And I think if the motivation was genuine, then they would be clamping down on extremism in their own party. You know, we have Swella Bravman and others talking about cultural Marxism, a well-known anti-Semitic dog whistle. Indeed. Um, we have when Swella Bravman was Home Secretary, she made that speech that was so deliberately reminiscent of Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech, only Enoch Powell was expelled from the Conservative Party for making that speech. She remained as Home Secretary. Damien Green, you can't, as a moderate Conservative, be comfortable with some of the comments that Sorella Braverman, Robert Jenrick and Lee Anderson have made in all sorts of different ways over the past couple of months. I, I disagree with Suella on, on lots of things, but I think it is outrageously unfair to say that she encouraged far-right demonstrations. That's a fact. She, it's not a fact, it's your opinion. It's, no, no, no. It's a, a difference it is between a, a fact and an opinion. No, I, of course, I, I, this certainly is. Look, it's a fact. Oh, sorry, I just want to point something out to. It doesn't become a fact just because you say it is. No, I know it doesn't, but I want to point something out to, just to Damon, too. How you described Damon just now as a moderate Tory, it's as a moderate conservative. Well, that was an opinion, not a fact. Well, well that's how Damien <laughs> described himself, which I'm going to take as a fact because I trust everything Damien says to me. But the key thing about it, even as you described it as a moderate toy right there, it, ex it, it indicates that there is a degree of extremism that has hijacked the Conservative Party, that almost to a point where the Conservative Party is not what it used right, well, to effectively let, be. Hit, Please, David, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't indicate that at all. I mean, in a first past the post political system, a big successful political party uh, will have to have a range of views within it otherwise you don't get elected and as you know I prefer there to be a conservative government and I accept that there will be people in the conservative party in the conservative government who will have different views from me we, we subscribe to the same principles um, but there'll be different views but but I, I return to the point I was making which is that I think to say that what Suella said was actually deliberately encouraging far-right demonstrations is not fair to her. And, and on that, I will defend her, even though, as I say, I disagree with her and a lot of what she says. And I think what, what this discussion um, illustrates as much as anything is that at times of heightened tension, the price we should all pay, with politicians, commentators, journalists, everybody, uh, when we're discussing these very sensitive issues at a very sensitive time, is that we need to use moderation in our language. And that actually, individual words, individual sentences matter. And, and uh, Have you had that conversation with Lee Anderson? Um, I, 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 funny, I haven't had it with, with Lee because I haven't seen him this week, but um, I, you know, I have 
long conversations, particularly with Robert Jenrick, who's a, we we yeah, because he we, he's somebody he's gone on a bit of a journey, hasn't he? I mean, he was always seen as a bit like you, a moderate. Um, Robert, I mean, Robert can speak for himself, um, and he has uh, he has said some some strong things about immigration. But I I, I would I would say that he's ever used. Um, I mean, I, I disagree with some of his analysis. I mean, I, for instance, think Britain should stay in the uh, European Convention of Human Rights. Um, but I don't think you would accuse him of extremist language. And uh, funny enough, can I shock everyone by agreeing a, a bit with, with, with Nadia here when, when she says that the, the language of what the government is going to portray as extremism and put beyond the pale is itself really important. And, and I know that inside government, people have been grappling with this for many, many years because we, we have got the uh, definition that, that Annabelle uh, read out. People think that may not be adequate. Well, ju just on that, Luke and Kenilworth is texted to say, Annabelle reading out that definition has actually strengthened my belief that Braverman is an extremist. So, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, uh, they, sorry, no, no, no okay. we're, we're running please, a bit late please. now, so we will move on to some other subjects in a moment. It's 8.32 News headlines with Tim Daly. Birmingham City Council has voted to approve £300 million in cuts and a 21% rise in council tax over the next two years. Europe's biggest local authority declared itself effectively bankrupt last year, mostly blaming payouts to settle equal pay claims. The Chancellor is expected to announce a £450 a year tax cut for the average worker when he sets out the budget tomorrow. In a repeat of his autumn statement, it's believed Jeremy Hunt will reduce national insurance by by 2%. And Donald Trump could all but take the Republican nomination for the US presidential election overnight. More primaries are happening in 15 states and one territory. LBC weather, some rain for eastern areas tonight with showers lingering in the far southeast, largely dry and clear elsewhere with an overnight low of minus 2 degrees. This is LBC.
8.36 on LBC with us. Damien Green, Conservative MP for Ashford, Nels Abbey, a uh, writer and broadcaster who's the author of the satirical book Think Like a White Man. Now, that's a pretty controversial book title, <laughs> it's, isn't it's, it? It's a, it's it, a, it, it? It would make me pick it up off the bookshelf in Waterstones. So. <laughs> well, uh, it's actually a good book. I'll bring you a copy next time we're, on, we're, or next time we're here. So, yeah, I'll make sure well, I'll bring you... What's the thesis of it? It's it's a satire. So, I used to work in financial services and um, and it was uh, it was a bit of a crazy world. It was a bit of a... Back, so the back Drop to it was that I was this black guy went into this very very white industry or so and I had to figure out how to work my way to the top and one of my mentors I had two mentors a white one and a black one and that was the advice that was given to me and one of my mentors would persistently say to me that look you're getting everything wrong you'll be at the bottom of the next five years if you're not careful or so because you're not thinking like a white man and I thought it was a fascinating interest they actually said that to your face oh, many many times it was actually a comedy it was wow. a comedy whispered thing it wasn't like a because look, white well, men the, ran the roost but how did that make was, you feel how did it make me feel it made me feel like, look, if you want to win in a particular place, you look at who's winning and try and emulate them. That's, that's how it goes or so sometimes. And and, they, and it worked for me to a certain degree, but I decided to to write a satire about it, to write a satire about being a, 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 almost a black person in a white world and how you how you conquer that world or so. And, you know, there's people... And I wrote it as satire. I think some people in government are probably taking it quite seriously and literally, and it's working for them even better than it did for me. We nod it. Like if, the people uh, who watch the thick of it and thought, <laughs> oh, I'd like a job in I mean, some, yeah. if someone says something <laughs> akin to that to you, I mean, you'd be furious, wouldn't you? People have said things akin to that to me. <laughs> As a, a brown woman in politics, it probably doesn't surprise you. It definitely wouldn't surprise me. So you need to get his book? <laughs> <laughs> I'll get your copies, Will. Also, and um, also, Annabel Dunham is with us, Deputy Comment Editor of the Daily Telegraph. Right, let's do a text question from Katie, who says, and you can all answer this fairly quickly, when will the next election be and when should the next election be? Nadia? Should be in May. I think given that the, the Tories are on the lowest polling that they've ever been on with only 20% of people saying that they'll vote Tory, three quarters of the public dissatisfied with Rishi Sunak and the job that he's doing as Prime Minister. The Chancellor being in deep trouble, Jeremy Hunt has donated £100,000 of his own money to his local Conservative Association What's wrong with to that? keep his own seat. Well, it's an indication of just how scared he is, isn't it? Um, uh, and I think I think all that of is that, over, over a period of 15 years or something. I think all of that is uh, a reflection of the fact that the Tories have nothing to offer. You know, um, 2,000 fewer GPs than 2015. The poorest fifth of households are spending more than a third of their income on housing. We've got 142,000 homeless children. Those are shocking stats. And all that the government has to offer is stirring up this culture war. I mean, take Rwanda as uh, as a case in well, point. I, I really don't want to go quickly, into all of these issues, partly very, because very we might quickly, have questions that's, on That's them. something that won't work. It's expensive and it's performative cruelty just to gen generate a few headlines. So in terms of the answer to the question, you'd like it to be in May, but when do you think it will be? Well, I'm not privy to that information, but I think if I was the Tories and I was polling so badly, I probably wouldn't want one too soon. Damien? Um, I think it'll be in the autumn. I think it ought to be in the autumn because then we'll see you know, the economy is clearly on the turn upwards. We'll see that. Four million, is it? We've just gone into recession. Four million more people with a job since 2010. Uh, we've driven up education standards. England has become one of the top performing countries for education in the Western world. Uh, we've had a record increase in the national uh, living wage. Uh, we've had one set of national insurance cuts. We'll get some more uh, tax cuts uh, tomorrow. We've got 20,000 extra police officers. So I will be quite happy to run on that record. Annabelle? I think it will probably be as late as possible because the Tories are aware that the scale of defeat is going to be enormous and may want to cling on to power for as long as they can before they hand the mantle over to the opposition. However, I agree with Nadia that it should be in May. I think that the circumstances for the Conservatives could get much worse over the course of 2024. We'll have an increase in number of boats crossing the channel over the course of the summer. I don't believe that the economy is going to uh, improve, at least not dramatically. Uh, the IFS recently suggested that NHS waiting lists wouldn't reach pre-pandemic levels until 2027, so the public are going to feel 
extremely dis uh, dissatisfied in that regard. And when Rishi Sunak um, last year set out a new agenda for the country, it included scrapping the NHS2 northern leg, uh, a smoking ban and tweaks to the A-level system. If this is the Tory vision for the country, then perhaps it ought to go to the polls sooner rather than later. Nels? I think it will be in November and I think it should be tomorrow morning first things first in the morning that's not possible uh, well uh, <laughs> we <know laughs> sadly that. it's not but yeah. i will i will give the tories credit on one thing over the last um, 14 years and it's what damien said about education standards that um so i live in a place called harringay which is a borough two halves one side is quite wealthy one side is um quite economically challenged both sides every single school is either good or outstanding and i think that's every really, one every single i think barring one school now other than that every secondary and primary school is either good or outstanding barring one which i think slipped and kind of destroyed the local the, the local measure so i think in that regard even when you speak to people more broadly now in come to london or so in the past you wanted to get your child to get a good school, you send them outside of London. Now, if you wanted your child to get a good school, you can send them confidently into inner city London. And I think that's a very, very good thing. I remember I did something controversial many, many years ago. Um, I I looked at Ed Balls when he was education sec when he was education secretary, and Ed always seemed like he wasn't really too focused on that one particular job. And but I then looked at um, um, Michael Gove when he was, and I just thought Michael was. Even if I disagreed with him on certain things, he was completely committed and serious on the job and did some things that I just, something I agreed with, something I didn't agree with, but I just took some degree of, like, I thought, yeah, you were serious, you were confident, you had a, some clear reforms you wanted to make, and you achieved on them. So I actually sent him an email at the time, probably doesn't remember it, but yeah, I sent him an email at the time when he was actually moved away, and I thought, like, just kudos to you for actually been focusing on the job. So yeah, if I think of the last 14 years, <coughs> I have a 10-year-old daughter right now, and the quality of education she's getting in, in our area is really, really good, and we're really pleased with that. That. And I think that is that is one thing that the Tories can take away. Is that happening in your area, Nadia? Um, it's, it's a mixed bag. There's, um, there's a lot of difficulty with school places, lots of constituents unable to the get a school place. The quality of education place. that children um, are receiving. The quality of education that they're receiving from their teachers is excellent. Um, the, the way that schools aren't getting the funding that they need so 100 percent of schools in nottingham east have had funding cuts and that has consequences damien you wanted to come in i, I just want to um pay tribute and nelson has, has paid rightly paid tribute to uh michael gove i want to pay tribute to nick gibb uh who has been a really really good schools minister for most of the last 14 years he's been in and out of government but and he is not only good in himself he is an argument for leaving someone in government in a job for a long time because mm. they get across the detail and if they've got a clear agenda as nick has then you you get measurable results so 88 percent uh, of schools are now uh, good or outstanding it was 68 percent in um in 2010 and and else's point about haringey uh is, is great that's what we want you will well if, yeah, well, if keir wants. starmer and sue gray are listening maybe they they might take note of note that you never you never know um right we're going to move on to a different question in just a few moments time it's coming up to 8 45. this is lbc
8.47 on LBC. We have Damien Green, Nels Abbey, Nadia Whittam and Annabel Denham with us answering your calls. It's one from Chris in South End. Hello, Chris. Hi, good evening. Yeah, I did want to make two little points, but I'll get to my main point, and that is that what is the government going to do about health tourism? Because I've heard a lot of, of talk, talk tonight about raising tax levels, raising national insurance. You ain't got to do any of that. Is my is my response. What you got to do is crack down on people who um, haven't got health, you know, haven't got health insurance, and they use the national health service. What you got to do is, is charge them on their travel insurance. I, when I went to Germany, I had to pay out about four hundred pounds for a twisted ankle that I had. It's a bit more serious than that, but that's what to pay. So to me, what is the government doing? That money could could go a long, long way to fill the, the financial black hole that we've got in the NHS. Well, what, what evidence, evidence do you have that this is a big problem, that it would raise huge amounts of money? Well, the, the main evidence I've got is, is an article that I read in the Daily Mail four days ago saying apparently that there's been about £180 million. Now, again, how accurate a Daily Mail is, I don't know. <laughs> but, again, that, that's... Well, that's I mean, you, you are right, there was an article in the mail, and that was £180 million uh, that apparently we haven't collected, and that's over the last five years. When you look at the NHS budget, which is around £200 billion now, um, that is a bit of a drop in the ocean. But having said that, um, Theresa May's government, which Damien was a member of, uh, ordered NHS Trust to crack down on so-called health tourism. Um, do you think that they have done so, Damien Green? Yes, and we've taken practical, or we took um, in government, uh, practical steps uh, to do it, uh, which is to have a special health element in visas people have when they come here, so that if they get ill here, uh, they will have paid for their health care. I mean, Chris is right that it, it has been uh, in the past a quite significant problem, um, but there is money coming in now. People who come here uh, have to pay in case they need uh, to use a health service, and that uh, will will discourage the sort of old-fashioned health tourism where you did find people literally getting on planes, having an operation when they came here, and, uh, and when they recovered, going going straight back home, which uh, you know, everyone who pays their taxes to support the NHS would agree is unfair. But isn't there a bit of antipathy in the NHS to actually getting out a credit card machine and saying, well, you can't have an operation yeah. until you've paid your £300? Absol absolutely. I mean, d doctors didn't like doing that. That's why if you, if you take it on the visa, then long before they get here, uh, they they will have paid a, 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 I think it's called a health insurance premium uh, on the visa. Nels? So, uh, I'm sure other people cover the financial side of it. I want to cover the social side of the question. But I think there's something a bit dark to this concept of health tourism. Um, ten years ago, almost ten years ago to the actual day, I gave birth, well, I actually personally gave birth to my daughter, but, um, yeah, but my, but, but my partner gave birth to, for us, wouldn't it? To, to, <laughs> my partner gave birth to our daughter. It's going to be in trouble with your we're, partner after this. Yes. Right. <laughs> so when we, um, we, we did some antenatal classes, I think that's what they're called, so like we, before you, and we met loads of different couples. One of the couples were a Japanese couple, and they were living in the UK, um, doing great jobs, whatever or so. And the moment you have your first child, you never forget it. There's so many things going on, etc. Then you go to the recovery room. When this Japanese couple were in the recovery room, a photographer from a British newspaper, which I will not name, broke into the recovery room and just took pictures of them in one of the most greatest moments of their lives. They found themselves in a newspaper with a splash about health tourism about them. And the couple essentially, they that you can see they're quite cut up and broken when they're telling us this story. And they told us pretty quickly after, and I think they've gone back to Japan now, essentially, because they didn't hang around much longer, we stopped hearing from them. So we just suspected they've gone back and their phones stopped working. And I think that there's that element that we need to be very, very careful with too, that the 118 million that um, potentially might be spent on people who are foreign or so, who we, which we haven't collected back, it's not the prettiest sum in the world. It's a drop in the ocean when it comes to the NHS. But the social cost of stories like that, and when people come into, come into the country and perhaps they fall on well or they have an emergency or, they, or they're here for work or they're expats, whatever it might be, or they might just be, be people who look a little bit or sound a little bit foreign, but they could be as British as the rest of us. We have to be very, very careful with that concept and the stigma we create around using terms like um, health, tourism, etc. Because in reality, um, the NHS is a care, is a 
a care function that we all chip yeah, into. But we can't be the world's health service. But we're not we? the world's health service. That's just it. We're not the world's health service. And the key thing that we also don't look at too is how much money we have potentially saddled onto other nations too when we go over there and we use their health service too at the exact same time. Which is fair. And please, Damon. Sorry, I, I was going to interrupt there because because uh, while well, well, we're sharing anecdotes, um, I fell ill in, seriously on holiday in France once. I uh, had meningitis and was taken to the local hospital where the, where the treatment was fine. But literally on day two, um, when my wife turned up to check I was still alive, um, they, uh, they checked uh, on my insurance, whether I had insurance or not. And, and the way they were going to penalise us, if I hadn't had insurance, uh, was not to allow any visits. So other countries <laughs> are actually do make sure that foreigners in their country actually are, are paying, their, paying for their health. OK, right. Quick answers, because I do want to fit in one more question. Annabelle. I think that the extent of health tourism and those trying to exploit the system um, is much smaller than many people seem to believe. We do have an NHS surcharge that brings in around £1.7 billion a year. So if it's £180 million over five years, then it's a very small proportion of the total amount that is uh, brought in. But Ian, you talked about antipathy towards the idea of charging people when they arrive in hospital. I think that that speaks to this dangerous idea that we have in Britain that uh, the NHS is free. It's free at the point of use, but it isn't. It's a system that costs tens of billions of pounds funded by general taxation. And we need to move away from that if we are ever to have a serious discussion about root and branch reform. Oh, Nels, Nels's ears pricked up then, but we're not... No, 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 we're not going to go there. No, dear. Look, I'm, I'm really glad that we have an NHS that is free at the point of use. I think that the underfunding of the NHS over recent years is a, a far bigger issue than um, the, the one that Chris raises. Um, I, I think for, for people who uh, are living here, working here, contributing to society, whether they were born here or born somewhere else, should be able to to use the National Health Service. Sure, but I think and what Chris I, is referring I to are people who right. deliberately come here to have an operation without having contributed to the system. I mean, there are, we've all read the stories about people, pregnant women, coming to have their babies in a London hospital because that would be inevitably a better experience than maybe where they come from. You, you can psychologically you can understand why they do it. It can be bad knocks, mother. But, but, pardon? It can be bad knocks, mother. That's what came about. So they is that right? They went to actually. Yeah, so that went, is a new one on me. No, it's, I have true, to it's say. true. Don't get me wrong. They, according to Kemi, they went private in, Har in Harley Street because they're a wealthy Nigerian. You're, well, they paid probably, for it. Though. Yeah, they did, but it does. And, and I'm not exaggerating but, the extent yeah. of this, but it, it, it clearly it's, does happen. It's a very small number of people, as as Annabelle said, and I think what a lot of people don't realise is actually how extortionate visa fees already are. Uh, lots of families come to me um, in my constituency and say how difficult it is for them to afford visa fees, and that has consequences, you know, it keeps families apart. Right. Um, you've, I'm afraid you're only going to have one minute each to answer this next question, which you're going to kill me for. Um, it's a text question from Mark. Would it do any real good to anyone if the king apologised for slavery? Now, leaders of the reparations movement in the Caribbean say it's now the right time for an apology from the king, but they've also asked him to create the architecture of change and the architecture of negotiation that could move things forward. Um, Annabelle. Well... Real good is a slightly vague um, choice of language in some ways. Um, I can't, as, a, as somebody who isn't a descendant of slaves, I can't speak to the benefit that I might feel were the king to apologise. But as a general principle, I'm not sure people should feel the need to apologise for crimes that they did not commit. And I would question why we have this obsession at the moment with slavery of the last 250 years and the reparations that might be required for, for that, rather than focusing on the 40 million people across the globe who are still slaves today how we can help them. No. I think it would. I think it would. I think it's an important move or so. The, the Crown, the Church, many, the Crown, the Church, the City of London or so, many um, aspects of British, um, of British life or so, of British high society benefited from, um, from the enslavement of Africans. Britain to this very day still benefits from the enslavement of Africans and the Africans or, to, or so still, till this very day, don't really actually have, there hasn't been any degree of repair towards them. I want to point something out just to advance this, this uh, conversation forward. We're in the middle of the 140th year of one of the worst, of one of the worst 
conspiracies committed against a group of human beings, and that was the Berlin Conference, which was the conference that divided, Af that divided Africa up into European colonies. And so that, we're still talking of slavery hundreds of years ago, uh, 250 years ago or so, but we now have to now also include that into the conversation too, because that, again, was another aspect and element or so in terms of okay. the, yeah. Damien. Um, I, no, I don't. I think apologising for something you've not done yourself is always a bit weird, and, and I don't. I don't get the, the moral force. It, it can it. do good though. David Cameron, when he apologised um, for uh, the what the British Army did on Bloody Sunday, I mean, I think that did have a positive effect in Northern Ireland. Yeah, it it it, it maybe, but um, I, I think it, it's it's not as important as people are making it out to be. And I completely agree with Annabelle's point that there is slavery is a huge problem in the world today. Yeah. I would rather solve the Uyghurs problem than, than, than try and go back and look at what should have happened 140 years ago. Well, let's do both, okay. I think Nadia. Oh, I want to do both of those things. Um, it's not about personal guilt. It's about institutional and ancestral responsibility. It's a matter of historical fact that the royal family was not just involved, but actively invested in um, the slave trade. And this is about having a grown-up conversation to collectively confront our nation's history and to, to recognise the, the legacy that slavery still has in society, both in terms of the, the families who benefit from it. Um, it was only in 2015 that the UK taxpayer yeah. stopped paying compensation um, is in paid off that loan to not enslaved people, but the enslavers. Um, and there's also, of course, a legacy of systemic racism that black people and people of colour still face today. So those wrongs need to be right. Well, well done, all of you, for being so concise <laughs> on a very complicated issue. Uh, right, our fun question from Bobby in Nottingham. Might be a constituent of yours. Uh, Rishi Sunak's wife says his special skill at home is making the bed. Bless. What's your domestic special skill? Please keep it clean. <laughs> Nels. I am very proud and humbled to say that I make the best jollof rice in Christendom. I am willing to throw down against anybody who wishes to take the challenge altogether. But more broadly speaking, I found it pretty interesting. I was watching the interview between Sunak and, uh, and, and Lady Sunak, um, and my daughter walked in, and her words to me was, they don't look like they're in love. There's so much distance. You can really see it in their body oh, language. don't say that. No, no, it's true. No, it's, it's, true. No, it's a ten-year-old's observation. It's true. And if you go back and watch it, you'll probably notice it yourself too. Um, I'm not being horrible. I'm just saying I'm saying right. it as I see it. You, you, you yeah. brought the tone down on that, I'm afraid. <laughs> right at the end of it. You were doing so well. <laughs> Annabelle. I uh, confess I'm pretty hopeless in the domestic realm. I'm a terrible <laughs> cook despite my best efforts. I've had many Bridget Jones-style disaster dinner parties. Um, however, I do derive a lot of satisfaction out of hoovering. I'm not sure why. Yes, the dirt is there and it's visible and you suck it up and it's gone and there's something so satisfying and enjoyable about that. But You're just um... weird. <laughs> <laughs> no, no on, on that point, I actually agree with Annabelle. I um, Hoovering is the one thing that I am better at doing than my partner, otherwise I'm also domestically useless. Although, if making the bed is considered to be a special skill at home, then maybe I'm not as bad as I thought I was. Damien? I'm, I'm completely hopeless at all the things men are supposed to be good at around the house, DIY and stuff yeah, like that. Too. I'm absolutely hopeless. I am, however, shockingly good at doing the ironing. Which is an, a strange and very dull This skill is a vision that we're all now having, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Genuinely, I quite like iron. Well, no wonder your shirt looks so, so crisp, really dare I say. See, yeah. I can't think of a single domestic thing that I'm either good at or would want to be good at. But uh, anyway, that's enough of that. Uh, thank you all very much, Damien Green, Nelson Abbey, Nadia Whittam and Annabel Denham. On tomorrow's show, of course, it's Budget Day and after the Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves takes your calls for an hour from seven, we'll have an expert panel of economists to help you make sense of things. Things. They'll all disagree with each other, of course. And I'll be joined by Dr Linda Yu, one of my favourite economists, the former advisor to Labour's John McDonnell, Anne Pettifer, the British Chambers of Commerce Director General Siobhan Haviland, and the entrepreneur and former Bank of England advisor, Dr Roger Givolp. So they'll be with me tomorrow on Cross Question, and it's going to be an interesting day tomorrow. Coming up in the next hour, let's have a change of tone. Are vegetarians being squeezed out as restaurants offer more vegan options, people who who avoid meat 
but still eat dairy, slam lazy eateries for lumping them together. It's a fight, ladies and gentlemen, between vegetarians and vegans, and we're going to have it over the next hour on LBC. What could possibly go wrong? Any vegans among you? Yeah, I'm, let's I'm, hope, I'm vegan. You're vegan. Oh, I was about to say, let's hope they both I lose. think we, we should keep them all <laughs> for this next hour. 0345 6060 973. If you're a vegetarian, do vegans somehow try and make you feel guilty for not being, well, vegan, I suppose? 0345 6060 973. On your radio, on Global Player, and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, Birmingham City Council has voted to approve £300 million in cuts and raise council tax by 21% over the next two years. Europe's biggest local authority effectively declared itself bankrupt last year, putting much of the blame on the cost of settling equal pay claims. John Cotton is its Labour leader. I'm very sorry that we find ourselves in this position. I'm a Birmingham lad born and bred. I've lived my entire life.